The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. Of the incredible work you have done in repositioning Ghana on the global stage and saying this is who we are as an African country with agency making its own decisions. Just talk us through some of your thinking behind why you do the things you do when you represent Ghana on the global stage. First of all, um, I want to thank you and also the, the leadership of the of the AFC for inviting me here. Uh, we have a very intimate association with the AFC. Uh, well, uh, a founder member, a shareholder, and the AFC has done a lot of very significant work in Ghana, especially in our energy sector, and continues to be very engaged. So when I got the invitation, I said, apart from other reasons, I have to appear and have good other reasons why I'm here. I have Nigerian children. I have children. Well, that's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who come from Ife here in, in, in Nigeria. So it, that's another important link. And of course, you know, the link between Nigeria and Ghana is of historic, long-standing. And it's, it's one that um, we're very interested in growing and expanding and deepening. So there are all these other reasons why I'm here. So um, it's important. I think that we don't have a choice. There have been models of development that have been outlined for us since independence uh, from outside this continent. Frankly, when you look at the state of our, con of our continent, 
50, 60 years after independence. It isn't where we ought to be. The critical issues, the eradication of mass poverty, the development of our economies, the industrial transformation of the continent, all of these have not happened. And they haven't happened because we've been following models that are more responsive to other people's aspirations and expectations and desires than our own. So uh, I came into office with the support of the Ghanaian people for us to have to be able to articulate a new way of going forward, which was first of all, identifying what are the critical issues that we need to master if we're going to go forward. Clearly, education is critical. And that's why we came forward with this uh, program for opening up access to education in Ghana, the free senior high school policy, which has now made secondary education in Ghana free in the public system of Ghana. It has brought about a significant expansion of access of young people to secondary education. And in that, we're increasingly putting emphasis on uh, technical education, on STEM education, as a way to the future. Secondly, we also have to have a more radical view of what we need to do about our industrial transformation. We cannot continue to be exporters of raw materials and expect to develop wealth in our economies. It's not going to happen. We have to be more concerned about the value added components of economic development. I was very excited to hear the president of the AFC in his introductory remarks talking about the issue of cocoa, for instance, where a $130 billion industry, the producers in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire between them are responsible for two thirds of the world's output of cocoa we receive less than 10%, six to 7% in the value chain of cocoa. That, those are statistics that cannot possibly continue. And that therefore there is a need for us to read look at our own strategy, our own policies, as far as cocoa development is concerned. In that area, it led us to an, an understanding with Cote d'Ivoire, which we have we call the COCO initiative between our two countries as part of a strategic relationship between our two countries, which is insisting on certain minimum interventions in the COCO industry, both on the part of the, uh, of the consumers as well as the producers, to uplift the incomes of our farmers and expand our capacity to grow. And more importantly, focusing the attention on domestic production of chocolate. So the significant efforts are being made in Ghana, not just now to produce the raw bean, but actually do something about its transformation in Ghana. So you have these uh, critical areas of, of, of development, of growth, where we need to refocus how we intend to go about it. We're talking about our infrastructure. We're talking about an area where we may not have all the money that we require. You've heard Vice President Osibanjo talking about the huge uh, infrastructural needs of Nigeria. In relative terms, it's the same as for the rest of the continent. I mean, the figures may change. For Ghana, is a much smaller country than Nigeria. But in relative terms, the figures are very constant. And at the same time, you look at our domestic resources. It is a fact that the tax to GDP ratios, for instance, on the average in Africa, are much lower than they are for uh, Europe, the Caribbean, Latin America, Asia, and for instance, in the OECD countries. They say that the average tax to GDP ratio of African countries is around about 16% whereas in the OECD countries it's 33%. So immediately you can see where a gap has, uh, has arisen which needs to be addressed, how to improve our own domestic resource mobilization. 
But the elephant in the room is that those who are holding the wealth of the world are not in Africa. Global assets in the hands of private sector operators are X number of times much greater than the assets that are available to African countries. So our access to private capital, to private sector financing, is a critical aspect of our capacity to develop on the continent. Would, and there we have a big problem. I would really like you to develop that point in terms of who are the institutions, uh, what are the institutions that are making the case for Africa uh, in, in those rooms where those who hold global capital are making decisions on where to spend it. We have an institution like the AFC, which has, of course, managed to pump into 35 countries billions of dollars over the years um, that it's, it's been on, in operation. But what do you see as the scope for replicating institutions like the AFC across Africa that can speak at a global level for us? Well, it's, it's absolutely important that, that, that we should expand the influence of institutions like AFC, the, like the ADB. Uh, ADB has recently gone for recapitalization uh, to enable it to be able to do more. The AFC uh, is in the same, and we need the governments of the, of the continent. We need to put our weight behind this attempt to focus. But we also equally need also to address structural constraints in the private uh, capital, in the global capital markets of the world. And the most significant is this so-called African risk premium. You have a, a situation where we go to the market for money and we pay much more than our equivalents elsewhere. You want to ask yourself the question why? It is because we are perceived as being riskier in, uh, uh, for, for the investors. Risk. How, how is that defined? Argentina, and this is without prejudice to... Uh, <laughs> but Argentina, in recent times, has defaulted nine, several, nine separate occasions on its debt. Yet, Five, six years ago, I believe it was in 2017, when Argentina went to the market to raise a 100-year bond, it ended up paying a coupon rate of, I believe it's 65 to 7%. Angola, which has not defaulted since the end of the Civil War on any of its debt obligations, went to the market at the same time and try to raise a bond, it was asked to pay two percentage points more than Argentina. So you ask yourself, well, what, what, what is it? What's going on? And these are the matters that the leaders on the continent, we need to find a solution for an address. And I think a discussion with the credit agencies that are responsible for, they're like the gatekeepers of, 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 of the international capital market and they are the ones who set the rules, that there's a need for us to engage with them very much more so that we can get a more even playing field because that in itself would unlock significant amounts of capital that are available for our development. But it is a matter of urgency that all of us need to pay attention to so we can do something about it. It cannot continue to be the case. You don't default on your debts, and yet you're considered a risk. How does that work? Risk is, done, is, 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 is attached to people who time and again find it impossible or are unwilling to pay. We pay what we borrow. And so yet we're still being stigmatized as risky places to put your money. There's something which is not right about that equation, and we need to do something about it. You, you raise such uh, a crucial point, and we have seen this with the pandemic. This is another thing your administration has pointed out uh, with ratings agencies, uh, for instance. Um, over the course of the pandemic, 56% of African countries downgraded. That number in Europe 
under 10%, 9.2, I think, in Asia, just about 28%. And yet, Africa showed great resilience. Um, I, I think uh, the contraction was just under uh, 2%, which, if you look at the global figures, was 3.3%. So, a clear asymmetry there. But the question everybody has is, but what can be done? What needs to be done by African governments to change that? I think uh, the statement that was made by Vice President Osibanjo is one that we all ought to take very seriously. The need for us to sit around the table and agree on the way forward in these areas. And when by are us, we, you mean I mean African the governments? African governments and its leaders. We have the opportunities in our, in our, in, uh, with our continental and regional organizations to get together to talk. I think there should be a more pointed effort on our parts, both at the continental and the regional level, to come to grips with some of these issues. We have pressing political and security challenges that usually dominate our meetings. It's unfortunate, but that is the reality. But nevertheless, I think that it is important that we we'll begin to focus our energies on establishing a common position on some of these critical economic matters because at the end, at the end of the day, that is the way forward for the development of, of the continent. So I think that is absolutely critical. Sitting together, agreeing on the way forward, and then of course, devising the, um, the, the methods that would allow us to, get, to, go, to go forward. I think that that has to be the way forward. And, 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 and the edges, the, 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 the drive for that commonality is what should be. And I'm particularly excited by the fact that in our time, in leadership in Africa, we were able to bring the African Continental Free Trade Agreement into uh, operation. That today, the Secretariat has been established, the trading has begun, even on a very limited scale, but it has begun. And we are now seeing, we're going to see very soon, the results of this common approach to problems bringing, bearing fruit. And I hope that it will be a harbinger of how the continent is going to develop uh, in, in the next decades and more. As we wrap up our discussion, I'd like to bring up something you recently said to your people about democracy. You said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. I'd like to ask, what would you see as the price for economic prosperity in Africa, the price for the eradication of poverty? What are the sacrifices we need to make today in order to ensure that? That's a large question. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you, you have sacrifices that have to be made by governments in terms of their control over uh, of, of, of their, their expenditures, making sure that uh, the expenditures are directed to what is really necessary. We have also the sacrifices that will be made in setting up institutions that really reflect our aspirations and, 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 and challenges. We have also to understand that nobody's going to come out from, uh, from up there or from outside the continent to develop the continent for us so that the sacrifices that have to be made in terms of paying of taxes, raising of domestic revenues to be able to confront the challenges, all of these are the sacrifices that are required for us to make at this stage. And we have to be prepared to do so and also to have our leaders articulate that this is the way forward and nobody is going to come and develop this continent for us other than ourselves. So let us understand that we have to rise up to the challenge and do it for ourselves. Other people have done it and that is what convinces me that we also can do it so long as we have the right attitude. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I think for all of us, that has been a true rallying call. It began in 1957, but of course there are longer um, and longer standing ties that connect the people of our nations. Over the years, many Americans have traveled to Ghana to remember the history of slavery and to honor their roots and understand their ancestry. And the African diaspora in the United States, including my home state of California, is significant and our nation is stronger for it. We, these two nations, share commitment to democracy. 
Last December, the people of Ghana voted in a free and fair election that demonstrated your nation's commitment to democratic principles and institutions. We share a view that all people must have a voice in their future, that our democracies are stronger when everyone participates and weaker when anyone is left out. We also share a commitment to global health. None of us have been immune from the ravages of the pandemic. We recognize our shared responsibility to collaborate, to share resources, to not only continue to address the effects of COVID-19, but to prepare for the next pandemics. And in that way, the United States is proud to be a member of COVAX and the African Union and has donated more than 1.2 million doses of the Moderna vaccine to Ghana. And I'm proud to announce that we will shortly send more than 1.3 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Finally, we are working together to expand our economic relationship. You and I have talked about that briefly before we came in. American companies continue to ramp up in Ghana, understanding the significance of the work that they do there to America's economy, much less to the partnership between Ghana and the United States. And they do this also because they have confidence in the government of Ghana and the environment, Mr. President, that you have created, which allows for some confidence in the respect and upholding of the rule of law and human rights. And so with all of that, um, we look forward to continuing to work together on all of these issues, including in the context of the United Nations Security Council. And again, I am honored to formally welcome you to the White House. Thank you, Mr. President. So Madam Vice President, first of all, I want to thank you very much for the invitation to come, to come and have this brief visit with you. Your country is one of the most important friends of Ghana and has been right from the time of our independence. We value the relationship and any opportunity, therefore, that we have to meet with the leaders of America, we have to take it. And that is what has brought me here to the White House. Our commitments are very much the same commitments as you have. We want to develop our nation as a democracy, as a country where freedom and the respect for human rights and the rule of law are paramount to our system of governance. Our big challenge, and it is the challenge of all those who want to develop democratic institutions on our continent, is to ensure and reassure our people the democratic institutions can be a vehicle for the resolution of their big problem, that is economic development as a, as a means to eradicate poverty on the continent. So that's the investment that we have made, and it is an investment that you have been very supportive of, and we continue to appreciate your support. We've had some difficult times in the country recently because of the COVID, like everybody else has had. Mercifully, its impact on us has been not as um, originally anticipated. It has been more mild than it has. Uh, part of it is the work that the government did, and the others is the general uh, environment in which the disease is working on the continent. We're grateful for the support that the United States government has given us in trying to deal with the, uh, with the virus, the COVAX facility, which America has been very strongly participant, and the support that we've had through the donation of the 1.2 million doses of the Madan and the promise you've made that more is on the way. Yeah. Our target is to try and vaccinate at least 20 million of our people by the end of this year. The Ghanaian population is some 30 million odd. And I think if we can achieve that, we will then be more confident about defeating the virus in, in the context of Ghana. The main, other main preoccupation for us is the, co the cooperation that we have to put together to defeat the jihadist insurgency in the Sahel. It's a major security preoccupation, and uh, the, the G5 Sahel, ECOWAS, the, the Lake Chad Initiative, all these are the uh, organizations that have come together 
to try and push back. I believe that's an area to where uh, the support of the United States government, and it's important that we set out right, right from the beginning. We're not seeking military assistance in the form of American troops or otherwise. I know you just had a bad example for yourself of what uh, American troops in, in some areas can do. We're not seeking that. We are looking for support in, uh, for our armed forces and for the intelligence agencies of our area that they can be in a stronger position. Many of those who are leading the jihadist insurrection in West Africa are the people who came from Iraq after they were driven out from Iraq to go. So I think that there's some information here that can assist us in being able to track down and deal with these people. So these are the, the main preoccupations that have brought me here to Washington to try and discuss with you and through you to President Biden uh, and, and hopefully it will advance our mutual causes and also strengthen the relations between our two countries. I want through you to express my warm greetings to the President and indicate to him that uh, in Ghana he has a friend in office and, uh, and the people of Ghana have a very good feeling towards the people of America. So thank you very much once again for the invitation. I'm hoping that will be not the first or last time. Experience in construction, in oil and gas management, and real estate. Think of what, and he's trying really hard to provide employment for his people. This morning, we're talking to the CEO of Empire Group, right? That's right. Emmanuel Kojo Jones Mensa. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good Welcome. to see you. Welcome. I hope you had a restful night. I did. Thank you. Okay, so tell us about yourself, what, okay. you're, you, what you do, okay. what inspired you to even start it in the first place. Okay, well, my um, inspiration for getting into business started from university, where um, a friend of mine, uh, with myself, we started a cleaning company uh, okay. in London, where we used to clean construction sites. And funny enough, that's where the passion for construction and real estate started from. So as, as a result of that, I was engaging with a lot of developers, a lot of contractors, and I just thought to myself, wow, this is something I really want to get into. And that's how I got into the real estate market. Um, I, I, I went ahead to start uh, my own company in Ghana in 2014-15 uh, with my family, Empire Concrete. And from there, we got into construction, real estate management, and that's, that's how it started. So all of this business inspiration came from when you were living in the UK. That's right. Would you say that your stay there changed your life? Well, yes. I had a lot of exposure um, in the UK. And, um, I mean, I come from a lineage of a lot of uh, strong business mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough to, to learn from them. Um, so some inspiration also came from, from my family as well. But I think the exposure and to get into business, starting to do things myself, started from the UK, yes. So behind, um, as, aside construction, real estate, what are some of the sectors of the economy? Because you're a businessman. That's in the right. video that we saw, you That's seem right. to be interested in lots of business. What are, what are the sectors of the economy that you're interested um, in? Well, the energy sector is, is an area that I'm looking at very closely um, because everything you see around us is subject to the fact that some power generation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. system is running that's given us light which tells us the importance of energy in our sector and if we want to have an impact in Africa, industrialize Africa we need to start thinking of how we can be sustainable in terms of our energy supply so I'm looking critically at that sector um, I set up a trading company as well okay. to bring in commodities, rice, sugar and all that so that's also another area how old are you again if i may ask <laughs> <I'm> old enough <laughs> old enough huh, to do all enough. of these businesses yeah. but you you left ghana about 10 years ago 10 years ago yes from when you left ghana and now that you're back doing mm -hmm. all of these things do you think that as a country we have developed enough um i think we have moved forward yes um but there's still room for improvement so much more so much more absolutely so um, there's a lot that we need to do and that's why um, entrepreneurs like myself are pushing the agenda to make sure that we create more opportunities create more jobs assist the government whichever government is in power to attain the objectives because you know entrepreneurship builds a lot of economies when you look at 
uh, developed countries. And that's what we entrepreneurs need to do to support the system and try okay. to create change. I, I asked about your age, even though you, you failed to tell me. And I asked you because it, it, it's, it's really hard. Well, I've had a lot of people, young people, say that it's really hard to come up and, you know, conquer the business world. Usually the opportunities are given to the much older people. That's true. Do you face the same challenge? I do, and that's one of the challenges. Meaning I'm, you're young. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's one of the challenges I'm facing mm -hmm. as a young entrepreneur. Um, a lot of people just look at you and go like, you know, he's a very young man. Why is he so ambitious? But that shouldn't be the focus. The focus should be the substance that I'm bringing on board and the impact that I can have on society and not my age or who who I am. You should look at what I'm bringing on board and that should be the focus. And I think once we're able to shift our mindset from the old, older generation trying to impose businesses or take advantage of businesses or get into the business sphere and transfer that knowledge and also enhance the young entrepreneurs also come up, we would start to see a positive change in, in things in Ghana. Okay. In a bit, we'll talk about the impact that you've had on society, i.e. in terms of providing employment and the rest. But I, I, I realized about, I was looking through your photos on social media, yeah. I realized that you went to Harvard recently. Yeah. Tell us about it. Well, it was an amazing experience. I think um, I was surprised when I was, you know, I received the invitation to come to Harvard. Um, but I think they were looking for young Africans in the, in the continent doing mm -hmm. stuff and having an impact. And um, by the grace of God, I was recognized and, uh, and I went there to represent Ghana in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, real estate development uh, in Africa and to also speak to the guys in the diaspora who are looking to come back uh, they wanted to understand the sort of challenges we faced when we moved back to Ghana to start our businesses and just to give them some sort of um, guidance a roadmap as to how to go about things when they're moving back into Ghana or into Africa to establish businesses which did, was fantastic did, did they sound enthused hearing your story and wanting to come back we, there are lots of people outside the country who don't even want to hear the sound of Ghana well, I mean, yes and no, because at the conference, we, I met a lot of Africans, young you know, Africans who were very passionate about coming back to Ghana, uh, coming back to Africa, but they were you know, not so certain as to what to do, how to go about it. So the, the will and passion is there. It's just a matter of you know, getting them into the right driving seat, give them some direction, get them inspired, let them understand that yes, it's possible here, we can also do it here, and, and that's, that's what we did in Harvard. Okay, now let's come back to the country and talk about your contribution to the yeah. economy. Tell us what you are doing in terms of developing Ghanaians and the economy at large. Well, I think um, it has to, I would have to attribute that to a collective effort. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just me. I would have to applaud my team as well for mm -hmm. making it possible. But we are focused more on um, creating infrastructural projects, uh, contributing to the infrastructural development of Ghana. And that's why we set up Empire Concrete, because when you look around you, almost everything around you is concrete. That tells you the significance of concrete and infrastructural development and our aim is to contribute so much to, to that in terms of road infrastructure, building infrastructure. Uh, you look at the likes of Rwanda, they are doing so well in terms of their real estate infrastructural mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. and we want to do something similar in Ghana. So what, 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 what projects are you currently working on? Uh, right now we're working on, uh, we have a hotel project that we're working on um, in airports. We have some townhomes and uh, cantonments. We have some projects in East Legon and quite a few projects. I see. You, you seem to be making a lot of money <laughs> at a very young age. Well, it's by the grace of God. Okay. Yes. Let's talk about your uh, corporate social responsibility as part of the Empire Group. Mm. Tell us about it and what your... You have a foundation, don't you? Yes, I do. What I is do. the focus of it? Uh, the foundation is KJM Foundation. I think if you go online, it's www.kjmfoundation.com. Um, I just thought we could give back to society as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, we set up the foundation to focus on three areas. The first area was um, clean, providing clean drinking water to less privileged societies. The second was um, school supplies to educational uh, facilities. And the third was youth empowerment, which I'm very passionate about. And everyone knows that I drive um, that, that passion so much. Um, I think that we have to give back to, to, to our society and empower the youth, do our best to train them, help change their mindset, help them understand the dynamics of business. And if we are able to do that to today's youth, 
the, the, the future leaders of our country would, would be in a much better position to, to make strategic, strategic decisions that would move us forward. And that's, that's, what, that's what we're doing, and that's the focus of, of the foundation, is to empower the youth, give them an opportunity, give them a voice, and teach them about how to get into business, how to manage and to create wealth. How are you doing that? I hear a lot of people talk about youth empowerment, and I, I, <coughs> I, I try to find out from them in what ways you're empowering them. Okay, so how are you doing? Are you organizing meetings? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the foundation is, is new. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're putting together a very interesting program that will focus on um, creating uh, uh, job opportunities for the youth and also funding opportunities because you realize a lot of entrepreneurs in Africa, in Ghana, have funding, funding uh, challenges, challenges right. and we're looking at how we can bridge that gap and uh, that's, that's how we're looking to get into that space of empowering entrepreneurs and uh, young people in Ghana. But we're also partnering with companies that are already in the process of doing young, uh, empowering young entrepreneurs. So that's, that's what we're doing in that space, yes. Okay. Is it okay for us to move a little bit from work and talk about your social life? Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're young, you're, yes. you're cute. Are you married? No, I'm not married. No. Do you, are you in a relationship? <laughs> I'm asking for someone I'll who is tell, watching I'll this you, I'll tell you after. No, she's watching, so she would, have to, she would want to know. I'll tell you after this. Show. What do you do when you are not working? Well, I have I have a few friends that I hang out with uh, when I'm not working. Um, football, uh, tennis, uh, very active in my sports sports life. So yes, that's that's what I do. Do you party a lot? Do you? Not a lot, but once in a while I sh I shake a leg here and there. Yes, but not a lot. I see. Yes. What does the next ten years look like for Koji Jones? I think for me, I would like to create more opportunities, and the reason why I got into business is to create employment and have an impact in society, and I would like to be in a position to create more employment, um, create more opportunities for people to develop, and actually have a positive impact on Ghana and Africa. That's what, that's what you should look at for Kudu Jones in 10 years. If you weren't doing business, what other profession would you have been involved in? You know, when I was young, I always wanted to be a soldier. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, not music? No. <laughs> no acting? No acting, no. I always wanted to be a soldier. I just like the discipline in, in the military and that's what I wanted to do. I used to admire the fact that they were always looking sharp in their uniforms and, you know, very disciplined. And, uh, Interesting. But do you dance? Oh, I can, I can shake a leg. You can yeah. dance? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I don't know if my, my director will, would have played a song or two to see <laughs> you dance. <laughs> Well, she says that she doesn't want to put you on the spot, but okay. a very interesting conversation and we are looking forward to when next you are empowering the youth, invite us, Absolutely. let's see how you do it because I'm sure there are lots of people who would like to hear your story. Yes, I mean we need, we need your support as well to help push that agenda because you have the media strength and you have that, that gateway to help us get to, get to the youth and empower them and help them you know, in their daily activities and try, try to put Ghana on the map as much as we can. Right, but how has Ghanaians accepted you? How has the reception been coming I mean, back? Into it's, the been yeah. um, it's been amazing. It's been, it's, been, it's been a very humbling experience. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of young Ghanaians and I think I might be doing something right for them to, 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 to love me so much. So, and I thank them for, for pushing me. Sometimes, you know, they, they encourage me to keep going. You know, I keep hearing things like, you are my role model, you're someone I look up to. And that, that alone gives us the will and the zeal to move forward and, and try and do more things for them. You won, you won a couple of awards as well. That's right. Tell us about it. Well, I won the, the Young Achiever of the Year uh, from Emmy Awards. Business Executive of the Year from Glitz Africa and I International see. African Award Merit um, from one organization as well. Wow. Yes. Congratulations thank and you. we look forward to more wins. Thank you. In the opportunity to thank the CEO Summit. It's a great opportunity for them to have created this platform for recognizing Africans, Ghanaians and even foreign entities who have come into our country to set up platforms to help build our economies. I started my business from a very small scale and I was just building on one plot. I wanted to be a builder. And I went to the land three times. The third time, something told me 
why don't you build two houses on one plot? So I decided to do so. I built two houses on one plot. And that became the principle of my business, maximization. So I'm not a, re a real estate developer. I maximize the use of the land, the spaces. Thank you. This actually opened my mindset for business and beyond that, for nations. I started to think differently. So from that two houses that went on one plot before Qualis Group was formed, this is what we have done so far and I'd like to share some of the projects with everyone here. So Qualis Group has five subsidiaries, Petronia, Wonderworld, Belfast, New Africa Construction and New Africa Foundation. These are some of the buildings that has come from the two houses on one plot. Qualis is a 40 apartment residence in airports. And number one by the Dankwa Circle is 108 apartment, apartments on one and a half plots. So this is where the maximization took. From putting two houses on one plot to 108 apartments. Bel Air Crest is in Cantonment. It's also 30 apartments on two plots. Avenue Lincoln, it's in Ridge. Number two is yet to be built. Ridge Carton is coming up, a great address in Accra, next to Labadi Beach. Double W is ongoing. It's the first um, uh, medical tourism and offices. Graduators, it's our charity project to be able to provide homes for graduates. JW Marriott, it's also an ongoing project. And these are some of my projects in LA, outside Ghana. In 20 years, I have managed to build over 700 homes from Ghana to other parts of the world. The point that I'm trying to make here, it's what my country has made me become. So I decided to put this together. The revolution of development, how the world has changed from Asia to Dubai, the United Arab of Emirates, the evolution of Europe, how we got developed so fast, Now these are countries that are on global economy. What it used to be and what it has become today. The evolution of America is very interesting. It's become one of the strongest engines of the world from how it was built. And it was definitely built on the government working directly with the private sector. They managed to build the one currency, the dollar, out of industrialization. The next place to be developed is Africa. Behind every vision there is an imagination. Imagine a new Africa, a continent of opportunities. Welcome to the new Africa, Petronius City. At the heart of Ghana's oil-rich western region is a 2,000-acre master-planned city. Within Petronius City is Africa's first energy city, a free zone enclave, manufacturing hub, the oil and gas university, a golf village with an 18-hole world-class golf course, and more. Explore more. Visit PetroniusCity.com. Petronius City, building the new Africa. Okay, thank you. So this is the vision of the Qualis group. Qualis is my mother. And um, I grew up with my mother. She was penniless broke. And so I had to turn this curse to a gift. I wanted to find a way out. But when you're born in a country like Ghana, when the average person is poor, you're all swimming in the same sea. How do you get out? That's where my motivation came from. I needed to move my mom from where she was. I managed to do so. And after that, 
I decided to build my continent, but I started from my community. I just wanted to build a small place in Accra. I started with these two houses, it became four, then it became eight, then it became 80, then it became 100, and now I want them in thousands. I that if I can put hundreds of homes and start to close the deficits of my own country, then I should be able to help the country get built. Hence, that's how I came up with the vision Petronia. I realized that Africa would not be built without new cities. And just to refer to what you said, Honorable Minister, that if we don't introduce digitization, industrialization, the technology hubs, the financial hubs, how are we going to create these jobs that will create the middle income to sustain our economy? And the reason why I think about the economy is I'm going to share it with you. When well, you can build a hundred homes and you don't really find the people who have the money to buy, you will start to think about how you're going to get those people to become richer. Because I could afford, I have the wisdom to do the development, but when I look at the economy, I can see a huge gap in the economy. So I ask myself, who am I building for? There is no affordability in our systems. There are great banks. Congratulations, Madam Mansa, on your 125th anniversary. There are great banks in Ghana. But does it really support our system? There's great operate governance. But is it endorsed by the government? Or is it time that we realize that the government should now marry the private sector? So we can start to revolutionize our sense of development, which will start from industrialization. This is why we are very interested in Petronia. Why did we choose Petronia? I'd like to share this with all of you. Petronia is in the western part of Ghana. The western part of Ghana has over 10 resources concentrated in one area. When you do these numbers, it's over a trillion, the proven records of the resources on the ground. I heard you say, Minister, that Africa in a whole which is 1.2 billion, have a GDP of 3 trillion. We actually have 1 trillion, over 1 trillion, sitting in the western part of Ghana, which makes it by far one of the richest regions on the continent. So what does that tell us? Ghana is the new hub of Africa. We have the most resources that you don't have to travel 200 kilometers or you can find oil or gold. Oil, gold, gas, cocoa, rubber, manganese, bauxite, on and on and on and on. It keeps going. It's all in the western region. Opposite us is the coast. The coast, the sea, is going to be our biggest business, logistics. The richest man in the world, one of the richest, Jeff Bezos. It's just a transporter, <laughs> logistics. So if we believe that the AFTA is going to be a part of Africa's revolution about trading, then we should remember that the private sectors should be able to situate themselves on platforms that will industrialize the entire economy. I don't see why we should buy 5,000 iPhones imported from China and come to Ghana to sell it. It's a plant. <laughs> that same plant can be in Takrati and that's it. We don't have to import again. Our computers, everything that we're importing can actually be industrialized in our own country. So my question is, when I did my research, there is 92% of importation in our countries. But today, 
we have over 400 CEOs here. Why are we still importing? 92% means somebody takes the money from the system, goes out of the country, buy things, put it in a container, Che se shisha kukonema na nun su de de do no mu chain kama no disbandra ne ny ja befia no no boris bees chicken BBC na shisha yes she a kukonema iria na ke the good old taste of a fia kuko iwa <laughs> yeah boris bees chicken BBC fresh tasty delicious 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 bra boris bees chicken BBC na bejo full frozen chicken gizzard Chicken feet, chicken neck, no ni chicken liver. Messi, if you fool when you're by John there, Seri a party. Mm. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. For, and and that's for Opoku Wari. Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming, mm -hmm. masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. masters are coming. And then they will sing, Prepare the world, yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepare the world, yeah. Then we go more, then we'll keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then they will sing, ah, uh, when they're tired, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens, Diplo, Owens, are we the We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How would you prove? Then they will start. I've been quiet. I have a bad eye. 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 Ni e levy because e levy problem no a e simple now Ghana government is on person or TSA in Tina ye bet so much then no what TSA ye it was your for 2020 IMF ma Ghana one billion dollars billion with the B same year no World Bank ma Ghana 430 million dollars nina for covid every year you know in 2021 no imf samma ghana one billion dollars bill one billion with a b now world bank samma ghana 130 million dollars in 20 2021 no so one billion 130 million yeah if he world bank buy any imf buy no now we say post covid Rejuvenation program say what be ma young economy no so into no World Bank ni IMF this is Ghana ma Ghana Ghana government call Bank of Ghana koyi 20 billion cities say COVID in T Nebuchadnezzar what World Bank ama mu 2 billion uh, IMF ama mu 2 billion World Bank ama mu 560 million dollars for COVID I know on some Musan call Bank of Ghana could eat 20 billion CDs. Say COVID in tea. Say she can't move who can contain trying yet. And I won't be. What move yet? Baby, I will be for Ghana. E levy tax. Who call ports are e levy. Who call airport. Who call hotels. But they are to be beer as for Ghana. E levy. E levy. E levy. Say she can't hear now for petrol. E levy. Who call union my port. E levy. Says he can hear now, Fana. In this, a ne government a person or tray and say Ghana for a be a yard and a year jumentina or de sa eleven reba. Yes, you appreciate the government to say, and you say, I do in your jumo, you who never cosono near Jai Amano. If you say, who per se wound ya eleven young, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, yeah, per se, yeah, 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 stand by, yet, dinner hockey car, yet, train fire. Or no one can say yes, yeah, responsible citizens, right? Into yeah, yeah, responsible citizens. Now, the thing is, 
se wo pese wo fihwe sika na wo di ye biblia because yen credit rating record former enye yen abrabɔ na wo di e levy ba beto so adenti because there is over 3 almost 3 billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency 3 billion Ghana into it also by 75% what also by 75% i will say by 375 million dollars 375 million save and not at the presidency you don't need 3 billion Ghana cities going to the presidency then now what are you mr kufuado and the near cost so presidency then now what is the kind of presidency what what is the thing what is the issue and now then now what is the legislature let Ghana legislators you have 275 legislators then that's our legislators no why am I gonna Say say minimum can say he Ghana fui. You bet me after I install it Watson, IBM computer. Our friend is Watson. No, ah, aye artificial intelligence. Ah, ebe ye nine over ninety percent of young parliamentarians. No, you bet me I replace one with Watson. Watson computer be one juma. Na yen downscale. Ah, then ye here two hundred and seventy five parliamentarians. Ah, then we ye magana. One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. Kona kubun kunta alana he. Enuechi, what was judiciary? Judiciary, he? America, yeah, 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana, yeah, 30.8 million. America, wo nine Supreme Court judges. Ekufuado ba nansi yei. Ghana near what ten Supreme Court judges? A Kufuado are twenty eight. I can In to say, say Ghana, thirty a, a country of less than thirty one million people. No, yeah, what eighteen Supreme Court judges? Ding, ne how young eighteen? Ding, na I think young now just a cronger will be as in Ghana, and they won't see you here Supreme Court judges. Ding, ten year old Supreme Court judges. A country of less than thirty one million. 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka, ka, one Supreme Court judge, be no liability, April $150,000, 150,000 cities a month. Kona kubun kunta, ne V8, order them, ne bodyguards, ne ne driver, ne ne te, ne krone ba, den inti ni yafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges. And un kwan cheng, se si ya mene moka se, ye wo 34, eh, eh, wo friend den, uh, 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 ambassadorial post around the world. Thirty-four. Vatican City. Ah, a will room cry. Yeah, wo ambassador woho. Deng na ambassador wo Vatican City. Yeah, magana. Munkan chile yenge. A deng ni wo ambassadors wo baby to say Malta nom ne wo friend deng Sri Lanka si Sudan nom ni ade. Deng o komo na yeni ade ba inti ne yeah wo ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. So we we'll read eleven. What is this? Yes, some were uh, fifty-eight uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no. Anka hum fasone se wo wo trade deska. Eddy income commerce a bre Ghana. So diplomatic missions around the world. They are fifty-eight. Sika ben wo de bre Ghana. Mon country ye near here. A ye crong waste of money and resource. Musi mo we read eleven. Ye betchira mo say eleven. No mon kona mon koyi infi mo amu. For two positions now, we create a whole new fashion. And what now, Munko Yinfi? I think now, more how Ghana for sa MPP for. Then now, Ghana for why Munti? Now the B I N T I S E N T I S E no. Sa positions he now he was he. Over two thousand executive positions. Sa what what executive benefits ne perks? What to come? What business class? What nya four by four? No money. This how many nice? What you feel? And I what also. And no no be ma e levy no income from e levy ni ye be nye fi ho mroso 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 den ne se se ye kachire e kufu adu ne wo government se sa ade no mun ko yi yin fi ho no na mo bo gana fo ka unnecessarily na mo be wie yi ne wie na excavator sa u nyanku pwa adu miyen se ye nsan ko ka ni ye nang ne ni emfa nye si ka ni emfa nte u ye e levy kason mo abe kachi yin se mo akwa shi u excavator is 85 Excavators are back here over 150,000 to 200,000. Masa kwa shi wana kahon. 
na pan no we he ye di cup no we he eh tea no we he anom cup no so awa bona aka ho eh ekufu ado and his government why gana fo ye mpene nde mpene china ye levi no wona ye zuba she wona no wa kwai fi sika no wa ba ye mpene ina le wope ne eh ye no mu ba ba ku ye be jina mu de ne ne se ye mpene ekufu ado and his government aden aden o se when uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness no mpp mfoni na be hu ho ya bram we not going to take this we not having this monfa yempene ne empene china eleven no ye tia monko enko cut legislature monko cut executive monko cut uh, judiciary nasi kan ambassadors any uh, were friend then uh, uh, ambassadorial post any uh, 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 diplomatic missions sign your money now won't cancel no more reduce no more for computers in your hair legislature say you what 275 no you bet me the drone drone i replace you one you're here 275 at the maximum four per region you're here 64 parliamentarians you're here 211 parliamentarians no where your liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Yerim. Yerim. Exclusive Recluse Decatur's Hotel, located at Kwaoma, the Bain Soko Bain Road. Book in for your weddings, parties, wedding refreshment, engagements, corporate meetings all manner of functions at an affordable rate comfortable rooms at an affordable rate your home for everything you need the Decatur's hotel a mono channel or kwaoma mobe timi akoye mo bibia ho bukia o parties o engagement corporate a empenyu foa mpesa mo koye mo parties mo koye mo bibia the car to Sakwaoma down the bank, Soko Bain Road. Okwa rooms, you know, at the phone book. Ubeti me, I will be a more and more engagement, more and more christening, more and more all manner of parties and functions. Offices for an asset and pay you for a more person meeting, so and also book here at the phone book. Will be a person who could be on home, be a sofa, be a family beer. The Catus, your home for everything. Who drew up as soon by Joe, a home so you come up into the Nyanam. The Catus Hotel, your home for everything you need. Monko Songwe, Namuba who say, Mom, what you do to Kwan Swan Bang? Mo ba, Mum Boki, Mum Bokia, Mobe Bana, which you are seeing, which you come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. Into the Castos Hotel, your home for everything.